welcome everyone to Sermon Notes for this week. We are looking this week at Matthew chapter 9, and we are looking at a short paragraph that introduces us to the author of this gospel, Matthew. So let's look uh, a little bit at who Matthew was today, and let's discover what we can about this disciple that wrote an incredible gospel. Now, as we're looking at this, we're going to see right away that there is not a lot of biblical writing about Matthew, and there is not a lot that tells us in the Bible about who he is and what he was like. But there is a very important passage that tells us a lot here in Matthew 9. So let's dig into it together and learn what we can about Matthew so that we can learn more about what he's written about Jesus Christ. Okay, Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 9. The setting for this story is Capernaum, and this is where Jesus has been going around the area and he has been transforming lives. And so we see uh, seven stories in chapter 9 of people who are moving from death to life, who are moving from being cut off or outcast to being part of the family of God, and there are mir miracles happening, transformations are taking place. And this is one of those stories here in chapter 9 in verse 9. So with this as the setting, we see that Jesus in verse 9 is walking along and he sees a man named Matthew. And so we're introduced to his name, Matthew, here. Well, there's a parallel uh, passage in Luke that gives us the same story and it's so similar that many people believe that this is the same person that's being talked about in Luke in that story. It is Matthew, the disciple. However, in Luke's gospel, we see that the name that is given there for Matthew is Levi, son of Alphaeus. Is this the same person? Many people believe that it is and suggest that perhaps Levi was Matthew's Hebrew name. It was his name given to him at birth. It may have been given to him because he belonged to the tribe of Levi as one of the tribes of Israel. It's possible that uh, when Jesus met Matthew for the first time here at this tax collector's booth, that he went by the name of Levi, but when Jesus met him and encountered him and he had this transformation of his life, that perhaps Jesus gave him a new name. And Matthew, in his writing, wants the world, history, to know him by his new life, his new creation life and the new name that was given to him by Jesus, the name Matthew. And that's possible because we're looking at these two writings, one that introduces us to him as Levi from Luke, and then Matthew's own writing that is remarkably the same story and therefore must be the same person. And he's introduced here in Matthew as uh, Matthew. <laughs> and uh, so what is this name Matthew and why would, if Jesus did give him a new name, why would he give him the name Matthew? And remember that Jesus uh, does this. We know this from uh, the disciple Peter, who was called Simon. And Jesus gave him a new name, the Greek name Peter, Rock. And we know that this is true for Saul, who became the apostle Paul. That's very possible then here for Matthew, that he was given a new name from Levi, from the tribe of Levi, to uh, the, the man, the disciple, Matthew. Matthew is a Greek name that comes from a Hebrew name, and so it's a, a Greek, uh, a Greek uh, pronunciation of that Hebrew name, uh, which uh, literally means gift of Yahweh, gift of Yahweh. And so that would be a fitting name, wouldn't it, for Jesus to give to a man who is transformed from being one that's labeled as sinner to somebody who is saved and now a follower of Jesus Christ, now being called gift of Yahweh. Well, I think that's incredible, especially considering what we know about Matthew's life before he became a disciple, and that is one where he would not have been recognized as a gift of Yahweh. In fact, people would have thought of him as a sinner and was called a sinner and anything but a gift of Yahweh. So as we continue in uh, verse 9 then we see that as Jesus walks along he sees a man named Matthew and this person Matthew is sitting at a tax collector's booth. 
Well, we have been told many times, haven't we, about this profession of tax collecting and how people who were tax collectors in the first century uh, for Israel were thought of as sinners because they were considered as thieves. And so we know that tax collectors were often thought of as thieves because uh, they could charge whatever uh, they felt appropriate to charge uh, somebody. And when they charged, they often raised the price of tax and took from the top, skimmed off the top in order to overcharge somebody and fill their own pockets. Well, people hated them for that. And they also hated tax collectors because they were thought of as traitors. They were employed by the Romans and therefore not just thieves and sinners, but also traitors. Matthew is one of these, and he's sitting at a tax collector's booth, and that tax collector's booth is situated in Capernaum, and some people believe that Matthew may have been at a booth that was more of a toll booth, a tax for moving along the Roman highway that uh, went down along the Sea of Galilee, down towards Jerusalem. And this Roman road was taxed right there in Capernaum. If you wanted to travel it, you had to pay. Others think that it's possibly a place where uh, the taxes were levied for anyone who was a fisherman. And that if you wanted to fish there in the Sea of Galilee, uh, there was some quota that was belonging to Caesar. And so it's possible that Matthew was charging people to fish and to be fishermen in that area. Well, whatever the purpose was for that tax collector's booth, we do know that he was uh, collecting more than was required in that place because he is thought of as a sinner. And yet, Jesus, when he calls him, calls him to be his disciple. That's extraordinary. It's extraordinary that he would choose this person who would be reviled so much and that Matthew responds with incredible faith. He gets up and he follows Jesus. And therefore, in chapter 10, we see his name added to the list of the 12 apostles. And he's actually called Matthew the tax collector in that list there in chapter 10, uh, and that's in verse 3. Matthew, the tax collector. What an incredible testimony that Matthew shares with us here. Uh, transformation testimony. And so we learn a lot about this writer of the gospel. And because we know that he was a disciple, we know that he was an eyewitness. And so that's another thing that we learn about Matthew here, that he was an eyewitness. Well, that's really important for us as we think about what this uh, gospel is telling us about Jesus, that Matthew was one who actually lived with Jesus and saw these things take place that he is writing about. Having seen these things take place, we can therefore uh, trust what is written as something that comes from an eyewitness. It's very trustworthy in that case. Well, that's important for us to know that this isn't second or third or fourth hand information, but it comes right from the source, right from the source. As we look into uh, some of the historical records, uh, we can see that uh, other people that lived at the time of Matthew and just after Matthew uh, actually agree that Matthew was the one who wrote this. Okay, well, if Matthew is an eyewitness to the events of Jesus' life, and if he wrote them down, the question is, when did he write them down? Well, let's look at a timeline. And if this timeline is from 0 to, let's say, 100 AD, the first century, then we can see that Jesus was born around, uh, around this time period, perhaps around 4 BC, some say. And uh, many scholars think that Jesus died around 33 AD and was resurrected. Dies and is resurrected around that time period. Well, when did uh, people begin to write down uh, the events of Jesus' life? Well, there is a lot of work that's done to suggest that Mark, 
may have been the first one around 66 AD. Mark may have been the first one to write his, uh, his gospel. And his gospel was dictated to him to, uh, from the Apostle Peter. And so uh, often we need to read Mark's gospel uh, from the lens of Peter himself. And that Mark may in fact be John Mark. Uh, that's who is talked about from the book of Acts. Well, uh, if Mark was the first one to write down, uh, many people believe that Matthew was second to write that down. And most uh, would agree then that his writing took place around 67. AD, and that would be just after, just after uh, Mark's writing. Well, the events that are taking place here in the first century after Jesus are events that are written about in the book of Acts, and so we can see in the book of Acts that there are early on uh, followers of Jesus who are doing extraordinary things. One of those is the half-brother of Jesus, uh, the brother named James. And James was, in my opinion and many others, the first to write a New Testament letter, a New Testament book. And so that probably took place around 50. Many people think around 50 AD is when James wrote. And then we have lots of letters from the Apostle Paul. And so the Apostle Paul is writing those letters sometime uh, between 50 uh, and the writing of these Gospels, 66 AD. Somewhere in that time frame is when, uh, is when Paul is writing. So as we look at this New Testament timeline, we can see that Matthew has written this down as an eyewitness so close to the time in which these events took place. That's important for us as we think about the reliability of his account in the New Testament itself. Well, I've put a little extra here onto the time frame just to quickly talk about some of the oldest surviving evidence we have of Matthew's Gospel, and it's interesting. So let's look at this extra century on the end here, from 100 to 200 AD, because it's within that time period that we actually have some surviving evidence of Matthew's Gospel, the oldest surviving pieces. They're called fragments. These old pieces have been dug up in the sand in places like Egypt, where it's been able to survive because of the dry climate. You see, these things were written down and uh, copied by scribes onto papyrus. And that kind of paper is made out of the papyrus plant, which grows along riverbanks like the Nile River. And it is organic material that corrodes, doesn't corrode, it comes apart and, uh, and rots and, uh, and, and disintegrates over time. Papyrus paper does that. But some of these pieces have survived in very dry climates, like Egypt. And the oldest surviving evidence of Matthew's gospel is Papyrus 104. Well, Papyrus 104 is one of thousands of surviving manuscripts of the New Testament. Thousands, 5,800 exactly. As such incredible uh, amount of evidence. This is one of the oldest ones. It's just a small piece. It's from Matthew chapter 21, verses 34 to 37 on one side. And on the back, is verses, our verses, 30, uh, 43 and 45, 245, which talks about in the first side, Matthew 21, 34 to 37, the parable of the evil farmers. And on the back is about the kingdom of heaven that will be taken away and given to a nation producing good fruit. Well, Papyrus 104 is dated in the first half of the second century. Second century. This is 150 A.D., maybe around 125 A.D. is when Papyrus 104 is dated. And there's an incredible way in which textual scholars date these ancient fragments. It has a lot to do with the way in which the letters were written. 
Well, I wanted to quickly just look at that um, Papyrus 104 fragment for us, just to be able to see how close the surviving evidence of Matthew is to the time in which it was written. Perhaps 60 years between what survives from the sands of Egypt uh, uh, to the time in which it was written down. This is important for us. It's important on a scholarly level because it helps us with something called reliability gap. And reliability gap is all about the time between the actual events when they were written down and the oldest surviving evidence of that. And that reliability gap uh, in this case is approximately 60, maybe 70 years. Well, there are even older fragments. It's possible that 104 is one of our oldest fragments, but many believe that the John Ryland's papyrus fragment, and that is papyrus or P52, and that uh, may have been even earlier than 125. Well, that's extraordinary to think about that little piece of the Gospel of John uh, being even earlier than P104. Well, John, this is a lot of textual criticism and a lot of interesting detail. How does that help us with understanding who Matthew is? Well, we've looked at Matthew chapter 9 and we've seen his testimony. We know that he was an eyewitness. We know about when Matthew wrote these things down and it was very close to the events in which they took place. And we know that there is surviving evidence of that, an ancient manuscript piece and many others uh, that have survived time uh, that exist today that make the reliability gap very short, which means it's very reliable. The gap is short, which means it's very reliable. Oh, that helps us as we think about what we're reading in Matthew's gospel and what we're studying, that we can trust this. We can trust it coming from an eyewitness source. We can trust that this eyewitness lived with Jesus and was his disciple. And we can trust that his incredibly transformed life is evidence of what he's writing about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. And we can know that things have not changed into legend or lies because there was not a great, huge reliability gap, but a very short one, making it highly reliable. I hope that encourages you as you think about the scholarly side of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Finally, uh, how did Matthew die? Well, we have only what was written after the time of Matthew uh, by early church fathers who have written about what Matthew did, and there's not a lot that is written about him. But we know that he did go, perhaps, to a place called Asia Minor, over to modern-day Turkey and was uh, ministering there. Perhaps he was flushed out of uh, Jerusalem and uh, Israel because of persecution that was taking place. And certainly uh, that is uh, something that's talked about in the book of Acts, isn't it? And there in Asia Minor, some of the early church fathers say that Matthew was martyred and that he was killed uh, because of spreading the Christian faith. Well, there are a number of different uh, accounts of how Matthew was martyred, and there is even one account by Clement of Alexandria uh, who's quoting somebody from earlier who wrote uh, that Matthew died of natural causes. But most people uh, don't think that that is something to trust because that source uh, was somebody who was writing some pretty heretical teachings. Instead, most people go with the other church fathers' accounts that Matthew died as a martyr. When did he die? It's possible that he died shortly after writing his gospel. It's possible that he died somewhere in this time frame of 67, and obviously before uh, 100 AD. Some people think that it was right about this time, maybe around 68 AD. We're not sure, but uh, that is uh, likely when he died as a martyr. What he left us 
is something that is extraordinary. It's one of four accounts of eyewitnesses to the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And I hope that uh, Sermon Notes this week has given you a little insight into this extraordinary person and the extraordinary things that he's written down for us.